We're back with part six of the Hands-On Big Data Workshop screencast. Uh, this is Ryan Womack, Data Librarian at Rutgers University. And we're going to talk about Spark in this section. Uh, there's one thing, however, I should have put it on the end of the last video. Uh, forgot to do that, but um, let's do it now. Uh, we're not going to be using that cluster um, that we used for our previous pig and hive uh, demos. So I want to remind everybody to go in, go into the Amazon Web Services, go into your EMR, and click on your cluster and terminate it. Uh, you want to terminate that cluster so that you don't incur additional bills. Uh, if you have termination protection on, you click Change, turn it off, check the arrow to confirm, and then hit Terminate. And that should shut down your computers. Again, you lose all the data, everything that you were working on on those machines. They're going to be gone once they shut down in just a second. Um, always remember to do that uh, unless you intend to keep it running, because otherwise you're going to get an unintended uh, bill. Uh, once again, the billing uh, for the Amazon Web Services is up under uh, your your account name. You can go to Billing and Cost Management and get a view of your current spending. So I've been on a little bit this month. I, I've accumulated $7.20 from things I was starting up. And you can see what happens if you leave your machines on. You can run up a much higher bill. All right, let's go back to Spark. Now, in order to run Spark, we're going to take a different approach. We're still going to use Amazon Web Services, but we are going to build our Spark cluster directly from scripts on the command line. So this will be a different approach for us. Um, and I'm going to, let's, let's talk about how to uh, get that set up first. And while the cluster is spinning up, I'll come back and talk about the characteristics of Spark for a second. So the Spark project at spark.apache.org um, contains the Spark software. So the first thing you want to do is download a version of Spark. Um, and usually the defaults here will be pretty good, but you, you have a lot of options uh, in terms of what you're going to download, the version, uh, what it's configured for. And I'm going to grab this zip file from just one of the download mirrors. I'm going to save it to my downloads folder. Uh, then take a look in my downloads folder. Here it is. And use whatever software you normally use to unzip things. Um, again, I'm on Linux and I have this squeeze application uh, to extract it. So now I've got a folder uh, in in my downloads, I'm only using this temporarily, so I don't mind it being in the downloads folder. You might want to put it somewhere uh, more uh, more secure than just in your downloads folder. All right, so now in order to use the command line, we're going to have to access one other part of the AWS system. And that is, we'll go back into AWS sign in and we're going to work with our identity and access management right now. Now in the previous sessions we used a key to access our account and here we're going to uh, create a user so the users can have different roles. Actually I want a YouTube user. I'm going to actually um, delete this user and recreate it just so you see how it works. Uh, so I create new users. I'm going to create one called YouTube. Create. And it's going to generate cr security credentials for that user. Now, just like the key, you have one chance to download these cr credentials at the first setup. Uh, if you missed that, you're going to have to go back and redo this step. I download the credentials. I'll save them into my downloads folder and we're going to see in just a second how we use those credentials to access the remote uh, site. So now let's go back, we'll close this, take a look at our users. Um, I can do things like 
create a password. I'm going to go ahead and do that for this user because I might later on come back and want to log in with a password. So the user management console lets us handle that. Uh, I'm going to attach a policy here and I want to give this user full access to Amazon EC2 so that they can create clusters and do, do actions on EC2. You notice there are many different policies for all the different Amazon services. Right now we're just going to select Amazon EC2 full access and attach the policy. Okay, so now we have a user. The user has security credentials. The user has a policy that permits it to do things on EC2. So we should be okay here. All right, now to run Spark, we're going to use the instructions that are at the GitHub site. Just go to uh, GitHub, Ryan Data, Big Data, Spark. And this file has the link to the documentation on the Spark site that tells you what you want to do. So this is actually, we're basically following these instructions. I've kind of given you a shortened uh, file that has the, the major steps here. So we want to use our, our terminal, a an interactive terminal environment and we want to use that terminal to log into Amazon. So the way we do that is to take our credentials and the instructions for this are are here, the Spark setup commands. We want to export our Amazon secret access key and I'm just saving some typing by copying it over. Now our secret access key is what one of the things that's in the credentials. So I'm going to open this up and you'll see my secret keys here. Uh, I'll try to remember to uh, delete these credentials before I put the video up live on YouTube so you guys uh, can't access. You want to guard these because people can access your Amazon account with these credentials. So the secret access key is the long second part. Um, I'm just going to copy that over and paste it in. So I export the secret access key on the command line and then I'm going to repeat that for the AWS access key ID. So this may seem a little technical to you. Um, it's necessary just for your initial setup. If you want to keep going back and using the same user on the same machine you will not have to repeat this step. You'll be able to quickly log in and automatically authenticate with these credentials. Uh, but because we're setting it up for the first time, we have to take this step. So we copy that over. Uh, let me move my cursor and paste it in. Okay, so we should be good to go. And I can close my credentials file. And the next thing we want to do is take the command in the next line. And this is basically an automated script for setting up your Spark cluster. And you'll see how easy this is in a second. So I want to navigate to the directory that I installed I, or I unpacked the Spark code in. So I put this in and I want to navigate to the EC2 directory. If we look at this directory, there's a lot of stuff in it. Um, it's all the code uh, for the Spark project. If we go into the EC2 directory, which is the scripts for setting up an Amazon cluster, and then we can run the following command. So dot slash Spark EC2, which accesses the script, and for each of these options, you want to replace them with your own um, options. So my own key is located in the downloads folder of my directory, and it's Amazon underscore key. I'm sorry, I, I make this mistake every time I, I attempt to do this. When we say key pair, we are just uh, 
providing the name of the key that's used up on the Amazon site. So that is Amazon underscore key in my case, just the simple name. Uh, then under identity file, I have to provide my own key, and this is where I provide the path to the PEM file that I used. And the other options are specifying the region that I'm going to launch the cluster in. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm in US East, so I'm just going to leave that as region US East 1, and then the command is launch my Spark cluster. So I should be able to do this. And it starts to run through its steps. So if you get an error here and you're returned back to the command line, um, you have to go in and figure out. I, I've done this where I've just put a little typo in the command or I've not grabbed the right key file, not copied my authentication quite right. There are little things that can go wrong. Um, you just have to keep going in and, and tweaking those. But once you get it right, it's a single, relatively long command, but a single command that automates the process of setting up the cluster. So now, if you notice, um, it's, it's doing things up on the remote site. I can go back to my Amazon site and take a look at my EC2 environment and I can see that there are now some things running up here. Now the default is going to be really small. It's just going to have a one master and one slave. Uh, I don't really need to do anything more for test purposes and I don't want to uh, run up a bill unnecessarily. So this is just creating a little mini cluster and you can see its scripts are initializing and everything. And so now while that's running, I'll talk to you about what is Spark in general. Why are we interested in this? Um, so there's a link here in your code to an article that talks about why uh, Spark is hot. Um, it's fast. A lot of performance improvements over a stock uh, Hadoop installation, but it can still use Hadoop data sources. Uh, it can use its own data sources. And um, again, I'm not really a computer science expert, but for whatever reason, when you start uh, looking around in the big data world, Spark is what they are talking about right now in 2015. So Spark is also uh, written in the Scala programming language, which is not something I've heard much about. But you can use that Scala programming language for Spark programs. You can also create your own Java and Python functions as well. So it's flexible. Uh, it's also flexible in the type of interactions you can do. You can do a quick SQL type query, but you can also do more custom programming and do it all in the same platform. So um, seems to be quite promising. Um, and I'll just note that as of June 2015, there is a, an edX course on big data with Apache Spark that has just started up. I haven't caught up with it myself yet, um, although I plan to, uh, but you can take a look at that. Um, should be, you know, running for a while. I have a link here to some other um, Spark materials. Spark in the Cloudera environment. We haven't talked about Cloudera yet, but it's, it's coming. Uh, a Stanford Spark class that has some pretty good materials and further instructions a post on setting up Spark on not on EC2 but on an EMR cluster. So if, when you go out and, and look at these things in the wild you'll discover um, you know people are doing many different things. Uh, you'll find some interesting projects and interesting um, things out there. Just to give you a flavor of the, the code when we're talking about actual statistical processing. Um, I want to pull up uh, from a Springer title uh, the, uh, a guide to high performance computing. Um, at the last slide on the slide deck I have a list of the references here. Um, I, I kind of like the um, 
the Springer titles because Rutgers has an institutional subscription that allows me to grab a full PDF copy, a legitimate licensed uh, PDF copy, not an illegal download, and and use those. So when we go into uh, this book, Guide to High Performance Computing, starting on page 234, there is uh, how to do a simple linear regression in Spark. Now, again, coming from the data side, linear regression is something that's usually a one-line command in your stats software. Um, but you'll see here that we're still at this kind of raw programming level. So this walks you through the, the steps of setting up your environment and uh, your variables so that they can be accessed and actually run a regression. And you can see it actually goes on for several pages. It's, I mean, it's not enormously complex, but to do a regression, well, <laughs> uh, there's still some, some work to be done. So what I would anticipate really is, you know, Spark is a very, f uh, seems to be very popular. These environments change very quickly uh, as people develop them. And if you come back in a couple of years, uh, you may find a lot of shortcuts for things that people are doing um, the long way around in Spark right now. But even so, it's popular enough that people have written books that guide you through the process. So let's see how our cluster is doing. Um, so we have uh, a SSH refused option. Um, this may be because our Amazon command line configuration is not up to date. So let's actually think about how to do that. I mentioned that I would loop back around to it sometime uh, from the begin at the beginning. So I'm going to consult my instructions on setting up Amazon CLI environment. And here we go. So this is another case where you use your credentials. So in order to install the Amazon CLI, uh, you can follow the instructions on the site. Um, there's an installer that just unpacks the software for you. Um, I've already done this on my system. I won't um, show you how to do that, but let's Let's just take a look. See, our AWS command exists. We've got it installed. And what I then need to do is type AWS configure and ask it to use my updated credentials. So my access key ID is once again in my downloads folder. open up these credentials again, copy my access key ID. So anytime you update your keys, you should remember to do this. I didn't remember to do it before launching the demo, but that lets you see how this works. And here's my secret access key. Paste it in. And I'll leave the default region name and the output format. Those are fine. And you notice as soon as I did that, my window started to spin in the back. Um, and it succeeded in making the connection. So that it recovered pretty well from the error. So it wasn't able to, to use SSH. As soon as it got permission to do that, it was able to continue the installation process. So once again, um, AW, install the AWS CLI according to the instructions uh, that you can find when you click on the link in slide 18 or page 23 of the slide deck. And then run AWS configure in your, in your uh, command line environment to update your credentials. So pretty straightforward if you remember to do it. So actually it's kind of a good thing that I was able to to do that in the demo because you see again some of the real life issues of setting these things up on the command line. And you can see our, our process is still unpacking and configuring uh, things on those servers. 
So let's go back and while that's in its last stages of setup, we'll take a look at the the code again. Um, we're just going to run a real tiny sample program just to prove that it works in a live environment. Uh, once again, I'm not a, a programmer and I'm not um, I haven't gotten into programming in Spark at all, so our, our purpose here is just to give you a feel for how these environments work. So our sample program is just going to create a little data sequence and uh, run an operation on it and co collect the distribution of, our, of the data. And we'll go ahead and just wait for this configuration to complete. It really shouldn't take uh, that much longer. Um, once again, by just seeing the, the steps that, are, that uh, the process goes through, you can imagine that if you do want to get in and customize your installation and make some changes to these settings, there's going to be a lot more than you need to learn about rather than just running as an automatic script. Their script is spitting out some warnings, but we seem to still be okay. And what happens in these Amazon clusters, I'll talk for a moment about that while it's running, is, you know, these are just raw computing uh, instances that you can then use to um, install any software on. So, so you can dynamically load any sort of uh, software you'd like. Uh, I'll just mention later on in the slide deck, uh, we have a link to when we talk about R, there's a, a slide for R in the cloud and you can use what's called an Amazon machine image, which is a preloaded uh, installation. It's just a copy of the of the entire computer that doesn't need to dynamically load things and run uh, and instantly install an uh, Amazon machine image, an AMI, on an Amazon cloud uh, cluster machine. So there's a web page here that provides you some pre-built R Studio environments. These are really nice. Uh, you, you just want to run a cloud-based instance of R Studio. You can copy one of these um, links. The instructions are all on the page and it's it, you'll literally be up and running in five minutes with a cloud version of R Studio. And if you've used R Studio, you realize that the server version is identical to the local workstation version, and you can perform your operations on the server just in the exact same way that you do on a local machine. Really nice. Um, and I've provided some other links on you know things you can set up on the Amazon EC2. I haven't tested all these, but again, it's a it's a very big, very active world, so. There's, there are a lot of things you can try out. Okay, so it looks like we are done here. Uh, some of the things failed. Uh, Ganglia is a monitoring system and it, some of those uh, steps failed. They might have failed. I don't believe that's a problem for our installation. Sometimes things will fail as deliberately as part of the setup when they need to be restarted several times in order to work. Um, but I'm not going to attempt to debug that here. I'm just going to um, take this as it is.